years ago, a then obscure criminal case had rocked a small town community located in one of the so-called Bible Belt states. Although the case involved a vicious murder of three young boys, the tragedy may not have come to national prominence without the help of a documentary which was produced by a major cable company. It was my personal belief at the time that the suspects accused of the crime were innocent based upon the evidence or, more accurately, the lack of evidence that still managed to bring about a conviction. The documentary did a fantastic job of portraying the accused as misfits being at the wrong place at the wrong time, victims of cultural bias that impugned guilt based on outward appearances. Currently, the media is promoting a similar motif with the Ferguson riots, a series of violent protests that was catalyzed by the fatal shooting of Michael Brown, a black teenager by Darren Wilson, a 28-year-old white Ferguson police officer who has subsequently resigned from the force following a grand jury decision not to indict him. Initially, this case appeared to have the hallmarks of white-on-black police brutality, especially with the media harping on the fact that Mr. Brown was both unarmed and was in the process of surrendering when he was shot dead. However, a closer investigation into the plain facts of both cases reveal a high degree of probability that the truth of the matter is far more mundane than was initially advertised. The deliberate ignorance of choice facts for the purposes of advancing a conspiracy theory is startlingly easy to accomplish, yet, as we will see, can lead to devastating consequences. For the purposes of this video, we will explore three critical facts of both cases that the mainstream media has deliberately whitewashed in order to promote a particular agenda of the supposed prevalence of racial or other external bias. We'll start with the Michael Brown case. On August 15, 2014, six days after Michael Brown was killed, the Ferguson Police Department released a video confirming that Mr. Brown had committed a strong arm robbery at a local convenience store, stealing a box of cigars worth nearly $50 and physically assaulting a store clerk in the process. Not only was this robbery the reason why the police were called to investigate Mr. Brown and a fellow accomplice, it demonstrably proves motive and context for why the teenager may have attacked Officer Wilson. Several witnesses to the fatal shooting claimed that Wilson executed Brown in cold blood. However, the Associated Press reviewed thousands of pages of grand jury documents that revealed, quote, numerous examples of statements made during the shooting investigation that were inconsistent, fabricated, or provably wrong. For one, the autopsies ultimately showed Brown was not struck by any bullets in his back. The academic fact that Mr. Brown was technically unarmed should not dissuade from the other fact that this is nothing more than a straw man argument. What it implies is that men without weapons are unequivocally not dangerous. Of course, this is a dangerous lie, and it also distracts from the physical reality that at 6 foot 5 and nearly 300 pounds, Michael Brown was a weapon. And the store surveillance video proved that on August 9th, Brown used this weapon as a means to intimidate and rob an innocent victim. Now let's move on to the first case that was mentioned on this video. As you may have figured out by now, I was referring to the West Memphis Three. On May 5th, 1993, three eight-year-old boys, Chris Byers, Michael Moore, and Stevie Branch were tortured, mutilated, and murdered in West Memphis, Arkansas. Shortly thereafter, the police arrested three suspects, Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miskelly. The speed in which the arrest occurred, as well as the subsequent trial, caused some people to believe that the small town community was targeting the suspects for being involved in the goth culture, a prejudice that was allegedly driven by satanic panic due to the macabre and ritualistic manner in which the boys were killed. The HBO documentary series Paradise Lost further sowed doubt in the prosecution's case when it revealed that Jesse Miskelly was mentally retarded and that his confession to police was coerced. 
However, a review of the facts confirm otherwise. The prime suspect in the case, Damien Eccles, has adamantly claimed his innocence throughout the investigation and trial of the murders. However, Mr. Eccles was mentally ill during the time the murders took place, with numerous psychiatric evaluations documenting his illness. In fact, public records show Mr. Eccles in his own writing describe himself as a, quote, homicidal, suicidal, schizophrenic, manic depressive sociopath. This document was released at the behest of Mr. Eccles' own defense team as an attempt to spare their client the death penalty. As with the Michael Brown case, this and other documents prove that Mr. Eccles certainly had motive to commit the heinous crimes. Jesse Miskelly was not and is not retarded. Of the various IQ tests that Mr. Miskelly took before and after the murders, he scored a low of 72 and a high of 88. The wide discrepancy in the scores was brought up by the prosecution which accused him of faking a mental challenge in order to receive a lesser punishment. Thus, Mr. Miskelly, though not of superior intellect, was certainly smart enough not to provide a fake confession if indeed he truly was innocent. The only inconsistency of his confession was that Mr. Miskelly would later claim innocence only after confessing to his crimes to multiple parties, including to his own defense team and against the advice of his attorneys to the prosecution as well. In a reverse parallel with the Michael Brown case, the claims of innocence by the West Memphis Three were undone by the original and accurate confessions of the not-retarded Jesse Miskelly. The assertion by Paradise Lost and the supporters of the West Memphis Three that they were nice boys that wore the wrong clothes is simply false and represents a major strawman argument. All three had documented criminal or psychiatric records prior to the murders. Their school records showed academic indifference at best and abject cruelty at worst. Although their appearance may have played a part in their being viewed as suspects, they were ultimately tried and convicted multiple times because of the evidence that tied them to the crimes as well as the suspect's lack of a credible alibi. The agenda of the mainstream media is quite clear, to sow seeds of doubt, discord, and disunity when no such elements had previously existed. While the construct of a dramatic story can elicit a range of acute emotions, one should at least invest a modicum of time to ascertain the facts of any event and draw upon the most probable conclusions, even one that is patently mundane.